Well, I'm so happy to have Carol Roth joining us right now. She's a New York Times bestselling author, and she's been a TV host, a radio host. She's a podcast host, a frequent guest on cable news. Hi, Carol. How are you? Hi. Um, I, I don't know what day it is. I wish somebody a happy weekend today. So have a good weekend, guys. <laughs> yeah, the, the days are just, it, it's so hard to have a feel for days. I mean, it's an old Seinfeld bit where Tuesday has a feel and Thursday has a feel. Well, in <laughs> the days of Corona, there is no feel when it comes to days anymore. No, I used to joke that my weeks never ended and now they literally never end. It's just like one thing is exactly the same as the other. So. Yeah. Well, you know, there's something I've always wanted to ask you. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> well, we've known each other for years and you've been so gracious to, you know, you've been so generous with your time. Uh, I know you started your career as uh, you were, you started an investment banking firm, correct? Yes, I was an investment bank. I'm a recovering investment banker. It is a 12 step process. I am permanently somewhere near step 11. Never have gotten to acceptance. <laughs> well, and now you have this, you know, you're, you're an author, you're uh, on television all the time. Was what this the, the game plan? What the hell do you do? Is, right? That's <laughs> okay. the question. <laughs> well, was that the game plan way back in the beginning when you first started at the firm that eventually this was going to lead to a, a, a writing and media career? The, the game plan. I look like, like there was some master plan. <laughs> no, I mean, I went into investment banking. I came from a family um, where I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. I had to pay for my own education. I got a really good fancy Ivy League education and came out with $40,000 in college debt back, you know, in 1995. So I had to pay it down. And that was the fastest and easiest way to pay it down legally um, was to become an investment <laughs> banker or a consultant. But I have ADD, so I didn't want to like deep dive into anything. And, um, you know, so what the plan was really to like, how do I get a lot of responsibility, pay this down and make enough money to have the flexibility to, to figure out what I wanted to do. And so that was really the plan. And then once I did that and gained the, finan the financial freedom um, to be able to do what I wanted to do, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but everyone was kind of like, well, you seem like you'd be great on TV. And I was like, well, that's fun. How do you do that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, the, the whole thing just fell apart pretty much from there. I uh, really wanted to be, still want to be a game show host. I have been a reality show judge, so I got part of the way there that was it we gave away a million dollars so that's kind of game showy i guess right um but you know still still trying to figure it out well you know it's it's interesting because i, I you know i just saw a video of you on youtube the other day where you were apparently were doing a feature on the peep mobile yes <laughs> what, what was that from <laughs> your tv day or were you freelancing and what was that all about? Yeah, that was, uh, that was a freelance uh, piece with an agency that uh, represented the company that made Peeps. And I got to go for a ride in the Peeps mobile. And we are talking about, by the way, marshmallow Peeps. So this is like a yellow bug with a giant marshmallow Peep on top, which by the way, I love marshmallow Peeps. That's a whole other story. Um, but yeah, I got to do that. And we, we went to downtown Chicago and we interviewed people about peeps and it was this random acts of sweetness tour where they were giving away stuff. And yeah, I mean, so like I've, I've done that. I've interviewed presidential candidates. I talked to congressmen on, uh, you know, a, a regular basis. I've been a reality show judge. Uh, like literally if there's like anything that involves talking, <laughs> I pretty much have done it. So a pretty wide resume. Well, you've been a, a, a talking head on the media. You've also yeah. been uh, a critic of the media. And I wanted to get into that a little bit, but you're also a small business advocate. Yes. In the age of the coronavirus, let, let's start with the federal government's reaction to all this re regarding um, how it's, it's affecting and its impact on small business. How, how do you think the Fed's response has been? I think it's been abysmal. And you know, the feds in general, well, actually everybody sort of feds on down, nobody sort of understands the makeup of small business in this country. And I'm not sure that anybody cares because there are 30.2 million small businesses in this country 
but only 6 million of those have employees. So the 24.2 million of them are self-employed individuals. Um, and then another, you'll call it 25 million on top of that are, are freelancers that don't have some sort of a business structure either. Um, so I don't know if it's that they're not a powerful enough voting block, even though they, they employ half of the workforce and generate half of the revenue of the economy, they always get shafted. And there was a really easy way if you're going to tell businesses, hey, we're going to shut you down, like you can't operate, um, even though that wasn't technically done at the federal level or at the state level, but kind of a suggestion that like, hey, maybe we shouldn't do this. In most cases, in some cases, uh, you know, it's just like, we're not going to do this anymore. Um, but there was a really easy way for them to bridge that gap and keep people on payrolls and not have them go on unemployment. And that was basically to have a package that did that. This is for small business. We're not going to make you jump through hoops. We're not going to make you apply for loans. We're not going to try and get our partners to get a bunch of fees here. Literally, we will give you money. And then if you're lying and you don't keep people on the payroll, come tax time, we'll sort it all out. Like this was not a difficult thing to do. Um, and instead they decided not to do that. And so while the Kennedy Center got $25 million, you know, for their buddies and then laid everyone off uh, without having to jump through any hoop, people who own, you know, a small auto shop or a gym or a restaurant now have to jump through a million hoops. And, you know, if they are able to survive, great. But we could have kept those their employees on the payroll and made sure they have a job to go back to afterwards. And you know, it, it's just it, it's such a mess. It's always a mess. It was a mess during the tax cuts. It's a mess now, and it's just really frustrating and makes you want to put your head through a wall. Tracy, I know you wanted to hop in here. Oh well, of course. I I love small businesses because my family owns one. And we're lucky enough to be kind of spared at the moment, but seeing my friends in the same position, some of them open, some of them close, some of them half open, and then looking around and thinking, what is going to happen with all these small restaurants and everything like that? If they can't keep paying the rent and all this, but then that just sits, what happens to all those things? It's like, oh, we have to rush and save Boeing. Well, it's like they have a lot of assets, you know, like let them declare bankruptcy and restructure. But most small businesses, they might not own their property. So is that going to get taken away? Who knows? The landlords go under too. I mean, the ripple effects of this are just unbelievable to me. And I'm sure you probably had quite a laugh. I don't know how far the governor of Illinois has gone with the shutdown madness. But the first edict that came down from the governor of Pennsylvania was shuttering all these non-essential businesses. And my favorite one, Carol, was coal mines. Oh, Closed tomorrow. Okay. Great, we're all gonna sit in our, in our houses and apartments and freeze to death. Because we're not gonna have electricity, but why not shut it down? So if you had the ear of the administration or the governor or anybody like that, what would you be telling them on behalf of small businesses? Well, first of all, I'd choke them all out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they were still alive after that. This is not a threat, by the way. It's just me being ridiculous. Yeah. Um, for those who are, who are listening and take me away after this. <laughs> um, well, I, I, like, it, it sh it's so hard because, like, this all could have been avoided. Like, I'm a strategist. So, like, yeah. strategy and problem solving. So, it's like every time they do something, they create a new layer of problems. So, it's like we could have just figured this out on the front end, which would have included, you know, lots of testing, which would have included best practices for people who are working. I mean, there are still a whole bunch of small restaurants who are doing takeout. I've only seen one that has any message about their people wearing masks. So <laughs> like, it's great, you're wearing gloves, but if you're gonna sneeze on my food or you're gonna touch your face and then touch it with the gloves, doesn't really matter. So it would have been real helpful to have some best practices you know, about distancing your customers and protection for your workforce and testing people before they got in. And then for those that you know, were going to close or were going to take a hit, again, keeping them on the payroll if that was going to be mandated. It's not socialism. It's, 
as Scott Lincecum of Cato says, is basically eminent domain, right? We're taking over your business. We need to yeah. compensate you for that. But it's much easier and cheaper, um, definitely in the long term and probably in the short term, than having those people go on Social Security and then doing this cluster, you know what, that they, they're doing now. So like now we're in a situation where they've wasted trillions of dollars and the money still hasn't gotten to small businesses. They have no widespread testing. They have no protocol. And then everything's just like a bigger and bigger mess. And it's like, it's very difficult to figure out what to advise them to do. I certainly think getting more money direct to small businesses letting them keep people on the payroll and pull them up on employment still makes sense to do. Um, and I think that they have to figure out some sort of protocol because the reality is, unless there is a vaccine, like when are we ever getting out of this? Like, I don't see what happens, what changes a month from now or two months from now. Yeah, maybe there's not the, the drag on the healthcare providers and I don't want to downplay that piece. It's incredibly important. But then what? Then if we all go out again, then it's going to create a new drag. So I just, I'm not really understanding the long-term strategy at all. And unfortunately, the team, like the White House just announced their business reopening team. And it's like the president's daughter and her son-in-law and like a bunch <laughs> of friends from the health club. Like, you know what I mean? Like, does not give me a lot of confidence that these are the leading minds and strategists that are going to help reopen the company or the country. Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's kind of like we need to launch an alternative team to their team and just start putting out strategies and plans. Like hear me out on, this is my newest plan is to put the quarantine teenagers to work. They're the least vulnerable, right? 16 to 18 year olds. If we trust you to drive a car, there's no reason you can't be working in a factory on a food processing floor plant or one of the things we need to keep running. We house you in an empty hotel or an empty dorm so you're t away from your parents and older people so we keep everybody safe. You're and then we bring back the kids, you're drafting the 16 Why not? Into the COVID army. <laughs> yeah, bring back, I'm calling them the quarantines, Carol. They're our frontliners. <laughs> But we've talked about how there's nobody in trade school. So if you want to bring American manufacturing back, you have to have the workforce that can do that. Get those kids on the job training. What else are they doing? Sitting at home doing TikTok dances. <laughs> Come on. Maybe, but I'm not sure how that helps like my massage therapist or my spa yeah. or my restaurant or like my plumber or the guy who owns the auto body shop or, you know, like, I just, I like that may, you could maybe use that as a piece of it, but in terms of the, the problem is, you know, 30.2 yeah. million small businesses, they're so right. diverse. There's the dog groomer. There's like, it, like anything you can think of and 20 million things you can't think of. This is what people are doing and that's what supports our economy. So like that could maybe be a piece of it, but people want to get back to work and we have no plan. We have no plan. Yeah. Problem. Yeah, I'm just thinking I'm seeing uh, different food plants are getting shut down now. And if that gets shut down because of sickness, not because of the government. So they've had walk offs in a couple different plants, and there was one I just read about today that got shut down. Yeah. That's where I'm yeah. saying send that's, the kids. That's why they need the protocols. Like, where are the yeah. protocols? Right. Where are the, the, you know, here's what we suggest. Like, I'm an individual rights person, I'm a small government person, small government people, uh, for those who seem to be super confused, but don't mean, doesn't mean that there's no government. We do think that there's a role for the government, but the role is protection of, of individual rights, which includes physical security. So in my mind, that's military, that's biosecurity, and that's cybersecurity. So this whole biosecurity piece, like they're not giving us any focus on, like I, I need somebody <laughs> to kind of come in and you know, Bill Gates is out there running around talking about a bunch of stuff and you've got a bunch of other smart people, like get them together, like you said, on a task force. I'll go virtually, not in person. Um, <laughs> and like, let's strategize this out and talk about, okay, here are the best practices and protocols that should be put in place. And here are where the risks are and here's how we can mitigate this, those risks. I mean, the reality is there are some people who have the antibodies. We don't know who those people are. There are some people, like you said, who are lower risk. There are some people who have recovered. I mean, there's all kinds of different scenarios. 
and that data needs to be put to work. And right now we've got Jared Kushner. He went to Jared. That's it. That's 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 what happened. And despite what the commercial says, no girl wants you to go to Jared. So I'm just saying. Noted. This girl definitely does not want you. <laughs> Well, you had the head of the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis. He was on CBS and stated that he thought that we needed to have some sort of 18-month plan of rolling shutdowns. And I don't know how a small business person can look at a statement like that and think, how am I supposed to uh, forget the long-term plans? How am I supposed to plan in the near term when – we're hearing messages like this from the, the federal government. Yeah, I'm a, and you have to remember, we have a tale of two different economies because there are parts of the economy that are doing fine or even thriving right now. Like if you're related to healthcare, especially essential healthcare, maybe not elective healthcare, like you're doing really well. Um, you know, there are just certain kinds of businesses that can operate on a remote basis, my, my businesses, all of my employees have been working remote, so everybody's like, eh, whatever, business as usual, assuming that the customers still have money 18 months from now. Um, so there's like a sort of a tale of two economies, but again, if you're the massage therapist, like what are you doing knowing that like nobody's gonna want you to touch them or they're not gonna wanna lay on a table that somebody else has laid on for 18 months without a plan? So like there's two different economies and you have to make the plans to address the different people who are impacted in different ways. And they didn't do that. They're just like, well, hey, if you made $75,000 two years ago, then we'll send you a check. Like what? Like what does that even mean? Like how, how, how <laughs> right. is that relevant to what's going on? That's just lazy. So yeah, I think, and then 18 months, like again, what does rolling mean? Do you have a business that can be transitioned online? You know, how are people emotionally going to feel about things once you get tested? If you test and you have the antibodies, does it give you enough comfort to go out? I don't know. There's a lot of different permutations, but I think you need like in a stra normal strategy session, because even though it's not this set of variables, there are lots of problems that have lots of variables. You, know, you go through and you run through all of those and you start coming up with different ideas and solutions. And again, I just, I, I just don't know um, <laughs> who, who's going to be doing that in a way that makes sense because everything that's come out so far hasn't made a lot of sense. Well, Carol, I'm thinking this is your chance to host your own game show and it's coming up I with the best strategies to, to get everybody back to work. I know. I was thinking about doing something on Twitter. I was like, is there something I could do? That, like, you know, <laughs> hey, you <can>. everybody. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see what happens. I'm The good news for me is I'm like super busy. Yeah, um, I think you're. Know, <laughs> even though my speaking and my TV stuff has kind of fallen off a cliff, other parts of my business have gotten very busy. Um, so like I'm not at a loss for things to do. Plus I've been working out like a fiend, uh, which is great. But I'm very concerned for other small business owners, being a longtime small business advocate, and for our economy, um, not just here, but on a worldwide basis. I mean, we're not the only country that is contending with this. And oh, by the way, we generally speaking have open borders. So what does that mean? Like, what does it mean? Okay, you're gonna open up businesses. Does that mean like someone from Brazil where this hasn't hit, which by the way, when it hits down there and everybody's on top of each other and they don't have a medical system in place, like that's gonna be a huge disaster. Like, are those people allowed to come here? And you know, like how is how is this all working? Like, what's the master plan? Like I just keep I know I keep saying saying this, but like right. that that's just the only thing keeps going through my head because that's who I am and like what I do. And it's like, what's the plan? Even if it's not the right plan, it's the good enough plan for now, and then we pivot. There needs to be some semblance of plans. Well, let's talk a little bit about the pivot. And, you know, eventually this is all going to pass, And but, but too often we live in the moment, especially now because the moments keep dragging and dragging and days feel like weeks and weeks feel like months. But once we get past this, do you think there will be a reexamination um, by the private sector about their relationship with China? Yes, 
hundred percent. And we're already seeing and hearing that. That was you know, one of the things that I will give President Trump credit for um, and his team as the foresight to see the issues with China. Now, I don't agree with the tactics that they used in order to address them, uh, but the foresight that like, mm, there's an issue here was good. And it already had a lot of companies reevaluating their supply chain. I am very concerned that once this dies down and has got managed that us and our allies, assuming they're still our allies in Europe and Canada and the like, um, are gonna be pretty upset with China and that this could end up with you know, sanctions, other tariffs. I mean, hopefully it's not actual physical war, but like this is not going to stop. And you have to understand that you know, I have friends who operate in China and they are saying that the government there is saying that this virus is from America. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that's what they're telling everyone. The people who have no education believe it. The people who are educated go, yeah, I don't really believe everything our government says. So feeling kind of skeptical about that, but that is the messaging that they put out. And so if you're somebody who is in China and I'm having these conversations as well, you need to be thinking about that because if you're not pulling that business out yourself, um, it's possible when things go down that the Chinese say, you know, too bad if you've got stuff over in a factory, like we're just going to seize it. What are we going to do? So well, I think it's a huge issue. I, I, I was surprised to learn, I, I freely admit, I didn't know just how much we relied on China for our, our, our pharma, pharmaceutical industry yeah. and, and the drugs. Is there a way that we can bring these drugs back in a way that's not very heavy handed by the federal government uh, through like, can, can we incentivize this in any way uh, through uh, tax incentives to bring some of this business back? Or do you think that pharmaceuticals are gonna look at this and say, okay, clearly we need to diversify and get some of this stuff out of China? So it's interesting. If it were any other business, you would say, yeah, you would go back to your customers and you would say, hi, capitalism here. Um, not The only thing that matters here isn't just the lowest price. You also want to have quality. You want to have quality control. You want to have the assurance of a supply chain. And so like, wouldn't you be willing to, be, to pay more for this product, um, you know, knowing the issues that we would potentially have? And in most normal scenarios, I kind of feel like after this, people would say yes. Unfortunately, we're talking about healthcare and what's going on right now with healthcare is all of this call for Medicare for all and cutting costs and pharma company bad and drug prices bad. So, <laughs> you know, I just don't know if there is a non heavy handed way because there is no free market around most pharma as it stands today, especially critical pharma, you maybe in the elective side, there's some, um, but so like the government cluster is rearing its ugly head again and gonna create more problems for us to be able to do that without being a heavy handed way. Now, you could make the argument that this is a national security issue. Right. And so it would be entirely appropriate for the government to intervene and like you said, create tax incentives and mandates and whatnot. Um, but you know, who's, who at the end of the day ends up bearing that cost because the cost increases. Well, Japan just announced, right? That they're, they're gonna pay for their companies to pull back from China and relocate to Japan. Well, I was shocked to know that Japan had anything going on with China though. They hate each other. They really do. And this was like the final straw. They're like, forget it, we're out. <laughs> yeah. <Howdy>. yeah. So <laughs> Japan doesn't really like anyone to be perfectly yeah. honest, but they really don't like China. So this was a, a good incentive and reason for them to just say, yeah, we're, we're good, we're done. Um, but I think it's, people are gonna look long and hard. Now that being said, the biggest problem that we have, like if you think about free markets, is that consumers are hypocritical and are short-sighted and have short-term memories. So like as much as right now, everyone's like, oh, well, yeah, for sure. Like I, I wouldn't want to do that. Like two years from now, when they're paying X amount for the drug and they're like, well, you can get it cheaper in China. Well, then let me, let me get it cheaper in China. What are you talking about? You're really <laughs> right. like, I'm just making this much money. So, you know, that's, becomes the problem at the end of the day is that nobody walks the talk and every problem 
can be blamed on us, whether it's our government <laughs> and their continual power grab, because the people we put in place there that continually grab power, um, you know, or things that happen in the market, you know, people like, oh, Amazon's so bad. Hey, Alexa, can I have some Doritos? Oh, I hate Amazon so much. You know what I mean? Everybody's just a freaking <laughs> hypocrite. So until people start voting with their wallets and make their actions consistent, they can sit and pontificate all they want, but nothing's going to change. Well, you said two years. I'm thinking two days. When the stimulus check starts getting deposited in people's bank accounts, I'm envisioning many Americans running out uh, to their uh, essential Best Buys to buy a big screen TV that's made in China. And like you said, they're going to they're going to have to sit back and make a decision. And unfortunately, in, in my mind, I think people are just going to say, oh, oh, it's okay if I buy one. I hate that it's made in China, but yeah. oh, I'll, I'll buy one. The, the only thing I will say that's different, I think, on that is for a lot of people, now it's not certainly everyone because of the parameters they put in, but for a lot of people, people right now are struggling to pay their rent and eat food and things like that. So there's a large chunk of the population where that $1,200 is going to like keep them afloat. And by the way, is not going to be nearly enough to keep them afloat. Right. Uh, but for the people who are like, Hey, I made $70,000, you know, two years ago. And now I'm up to like, a, you know, 85 grand. And you know, I live in my dad's basement. Whatever. Yeah. I got Like I'll go buy, you know, like you said, a big screen TV, whatever. It's not even going to occur to them. So that's what happens when you give people quote unquote free money that's really their money that they're going to have to pay for with higher taxes later but nobody told them it was a high interest loan in an area or an era when we have no interest rates so. <laughs> right. <laughs> thank you i kind of why i love you guys because you actually understand what i'm saying when i say that and so you think it's like you can see the the, the humor and the darkness here, but I've got a lot of people, I'll say that to them, like, what, what do you mean? It's, no, the government's sending me $1,200. That nice? No, they don't yes. make it, they just government. take it. That's how it works. It's very That's simple. Fantastic. Very well, generous, and very generous government. Uncle Sam, he's a nice uncle. <laughs> well, in this case, they are just printing it. I mean, we do have to pay for it eventually, but now I've seen the argument and, and the and this was coming from a, a right winger. I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with the podcast, um, Quoth the Raven. That's a, oh, yeah. yeah. I know Chris, Chris well and, and uh, have done stuff with him in person before. He's a great guy. Yeah, he, he had tweeted the other day something to the effect of, um, now the question becomes, why do we pay taxes if the Fed can just print trillions of dollars? Yeah, I mean, it's what they're doing, and this is like a whole other level of insanity and knowledge base, but what the Fed has been doing is despicable and potentially like, has like huge implications for the stock market, inflation and or deflation and right. the future, and just like all kinds of other things. They have gone completely rogue, and honestly, anyone associated with them should be fired and smacked around again so yeah because i'm hearing you talking about oh you know we can move everything back from china and all this stuff and then people are going to deal with a little bit of a price increase and suck it up and then thinking what the fed's done we don't know if that's going to cause this huge inflation or massive deflation i mean but if you had inflation plus bringing stuff home prices are going to go through the roof so yes. everybody should buy wheelbarrows exactly. now I, yeah, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen um, you know, they, they've artificially depressed interest rates. They've taken them to zero. They say there's no value in loaning money. It's basically <laughs> the, the shorthand for that. So like too bad if you wanted to retire or you're a retiree and you depend on fixed income for your, your livelihood. Uh, money isn't worth anything apparently anymore. Um, so that, and by the way, had, had absolutely no effect on the market. So they like basically blew their dry powder and had no effect. And oh, by the way, they shouldn't be propping up the markets. That's not their mandate. And then now they're going in and they're buying securities. And it's not just, I mean, before it was like treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. Now they've hired like Wall Street guys. And by the way, I'm a former investment banker. So like, trust me when I'm like raising the red flag, it, uh, there's certain kinds of Wall Street guys that are good. And then there's certain ones that you're like, woo, 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 um, to advise <laughs> them on buying high yield. And they're going to talk about buying equities. Like, why do we want the Fed 
propping up the price of equities like right now. Like I don't, I don't fundamentally understand. Like if we're having an issue, like let everything fall, let everything be where where it is. And then as things get better, then we can deploy the capital into those companies and they'll go back up again. Like it's, it's fine. It's natural. And this, this fed interference, like I said, like I can't, cause I, I discuss this with my husband all the time. And it's like, I can't tell, is it going to cause inflation or when it all comes crashing down, does it cause massive deflation? Like I can't even get my head around it, but there's some bad thing that probably ends inflation that is going to happen here. And I could probably <laughs> make an argument about many different ones. So. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, Carol. I, I saw recently the parent company of Logan's Steakhouses. Uh, they announced that they're closing all their restaurants permanently. And there's been talk about the hospitality industry taking a hit, travel, yeah. you know, airlines, uh, those industries will, will be hit hard by this. But what other areas of the economy um, that people maybe are not talking about as much. Where are we going to see other places where there's going to be heavy bankruptcies? And uh, I, I hate to use the term bailouts because so much of this is a, a government-induced coma of the American economy. But where are yeah. some of the other sectors that are going to be hardest hit by this? So you've got to look at real estate because you've got on the corporate side, whether it's the physical locations that to all of these places that you're talking about, or the people who work there who can't afford to pay their rent, or maybe can't afford their nursing home or whatever it is, but anything that's related to real estate in some way, shape or form, I think, you know, stands to suffer. Um, anything that's a one-on-one -on -one service like we talk about restaurants and bars but like what about your hairdresser what about your dog groomer what about your nail tech what about your you know massage therapist like anything that, where you're just doing one-on-one -on -one types of things um you know right now like my brother-in-law does guitar lessons and he was able to transition to that online but if people start hurting like those kinds of things might become a luxury. So anything that isn't a necessity then becomes the next sort of set of dominoes to fall. So there's the like, hey, people literally can't get there or like wouldn't want to touch you with a 10 foot pole because that's like the social distancing. And then there's the like, okay, well, what's the luxury that I don't need right now? And so if you have a business that isn't critical to people's lives, obviously they're going to prioritize feeding their families. Most people have, you know, enough clothes to kind of get you through a pinch here, right? And so, you know, healthcare, whatnot. But, you know, it's just kind of one right after the other. Obviously these, um, you know, tech companies that are enabling communication, I think, fare very well um, and essential services and products and anything that obviously has to do with toilet paper or Clorox wipes because you just still can't get them anywhere. <laughs> um, you know, those, those do well, but you know, it, it becomes a domino effect. And the first to, to fall, obviously we saw were those places, but as people can't afford things, you know, just think about your life. What is it on your credit card statement that you can do without um, you know, and you'll, you'll, you'll make the stretch for Netflix cause it's, you know, 10 or $12 a month and it provides all of your entertainment, but there are a bunch of other things that are going to go by the wayside. Well, yeah, that's true. And the other thing that I keep thinking about too is, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we all live in the moment. And when something like this happens, a lot of people will, will say, Oh, this has changed us permanently. And then later on, you find it really hasn't changed just permanently. But I, I wonder if after this is all over, if there will be a reexamination of how business does business. And you mentioned real estate will off, uh, you know, will firms say to themselves, we don't need this big office in a skyscraper in downtown anymore. Uh, we have so much of our workforce now working yeah. from home may as well let them stay working from yeah. home. Is this really something that we're going to look at and say this permanently changed the way we look at work and how we do business? 100%. Um, and it certainly it won't be every business and it won't be every part of every business. Uh, but you know, I was joking around with some people that I know professionally 
and saying like, I'm still getting as much work done. And like, I don't have to get on an airplane every week and I don't have to go to these meetings and I don't have to do this and I don't have to do that. Like, maybe I don't need to do that again uh, afterwards. Now, granted, we all kind of live in patterns. So uh, certainly in the short term and the medium term, there are changes, whether or not we, you know, go back to things longer term people are creatures of habit so it just kind of depends on how it works for the business but yes this is going to shift a lot of businesses um whether it's uh, you know intentionally or accidentally just by the virtue of of what's going on here so let's look for a second uh toward november what's 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 your take what month I'm... are we in now <laughs> where, where am i february Carol. It's, it's, it's March, March 44th or something like that. Yes, yes. Something like that. <laughs> uh, if, if it happens, what do you make of uh, a Biden versus Trump campaign? Oh my God. It's demented versus dementia. I, like, what, <laughs> I, like, I don't even know what to say. Like it's, you know, <laughs> there's like, there's so many different ways to think about it. Like there's, the Supreme Court way to think about it, right? That like, this is gonna impact the Supreme Court and maybe that's the most important thing since that's got a longer tail. And so you just kind of vote based on who you think is gonna pick the right judges for the Supreme Court that are gonna sit on there for the next 100 years or <laughs> however long they're living now. Um, so yeah, it's like, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what you do. Like I have so many mixed emotions about the whole thing. I mean, a lot of it will depend on who Biden picks as his vice president. Um, and, or if there's like a shenanigan swap, like I'm still not sold on the fact that, that this isn't going to be Hillary again. <laughs> so I feel like like, I don't know that Biden gets to November, it, like, by his own choice or not his own choice or whatever. And I'm, I'm not trying to be facetious or, like, a jerk or anything. I just, um, I don't, I worry about his cognitive abilities. And as somebody who deals in that space in one of my businesses, I think it is potentially very cruel. And... You know, so I think that who he is aligned with is going to play very heavily on whether people who are very frustrated with Jared and Ivanka ruling the world um, decide that, that they're going to make a change. I think it's going to depend. I mean, if he were smart and had smart advisors, he would go very moderate. He would, he would like set up a reach across the aisle strategy and say, listen, I'm going to be center here. And, you know, maybe I even pull some people who are former Republicans or libertarians or Justin Amash or, you know, whoever it is and say, these are going to be my people because, I, you know, I feel really strongly that we need to represent a, a cross section of what's going on here. And if he, if he did that, I think there would be a lot of people who... Um, otherwise would never vote Democrat who would say, listen, like this has been a hot mess. Like we need to extract ourselves from this and, and we'll feel comfortable voting for Biden. If he doesn't, if he goes the like Stacey Abrams route and like Bernie gets a cabinet position and Elizabeth Warren's hanging out and like he can't put a sentence together and Hillary's in the wing, then it's like, a, like, I just, I don't know. It's, it's like worse than last time when last time was bad. So yeah. I, I don't know. It's so entertaining to watch this because you <laughs> saw so many people. Yeah, yeah honestly, if it, it, as a content provider, if I just pretend that this isn't my country, this is right. a blast to watch and <laughs> provide content right. and commentary. You, you extract yourself from the situation, take your personal feelings and the fact that it affects the future and your children and grandchildren out of it. It is kind of hilarious. Right, exactly. But it's it's fun to watch how, you know, in 2016, there were so many on the left that were throwing this narrative out there that it's disgusting that Republicans could vote for someone, a horrible human being like Donald Trump, and then try to sell us on voting for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and now the last three years, we've heard, oh, you know, 
Uh, Donald Trump, it's an embarrassment to see him get behind a microphone. He's got a fifth grader's vocabulary. And now they're about ready to, to nominate a guy who can't string three sentences together. It's amazing and, to watch. And again, it's, I feel badly because I just... I don't know that I think a lot of people are in denial. I think there are a lot of people who are are just being like, oh, he's a gaff guy, he's a stutterer. It's like, no, this is a man who does not seem and again, I'm not a doctor, but as somebody who deals with aging issues and has a product around this, like he his cognitive abilities do not seem to be the same as they were previously, and it seems somewhat abusive that they're doing this to him. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the, the odd thing is I understand that there's probably this internal struggle, at least with his handlers, his advisors, the consultant class that are worried that he's getting kind of lost right now in what's in national events. But that's events. the best thing for him. That's honestly, I yeah. said this right. before any of this happened. I said this like probably maybe October or November um, on Bulls and Bears, which was my show before it went on hiatus. <laughs> I'm a panelist if it ever comes back. Um, and I said that like his best strategy is to just not say anything. So just like let people be like, oh, that was the guy who was VP. He must know what he's doing. The less that he can say, honestly, is better for his chances of winning. So strategically, the fact that this is all going on and he is totally under the radar and Trump's getting beaten up and whatever, like is working not only say to the country's advantage, but like to if you're if you're voting for him to get the votes, like that's his number one best case scenario is like they never even debate. It's just like two names out there, you pick one Here's the smiley face. Remember, this guy used to be VP. That's honestly his best case scenario. Well, that's what I find fascinating about. They made a big deal about him launching a new podcast. And I don't know if you've heard Here's the Deal with Joe Biden at all, Carol, but the first episode, they, they're, they're labeling it as oh, a calming voice in these troubling times. And then you listen to the show and he, he wants to be Larry King. It's like, I expect him to say, Joe from Walla Walla, hello. He brings on a guest and he just asks simple one or two sentence questions and lets his guest articulate his agenda. And to me, it just highlights even more how it, this, this isn't a good candidate for 2020 for the Democrats because, well, you know, I hate to beat a dead horse, but it, it just doesn't feel like he's able to articulate his agenda. Okay, so here's what I'll say. I'll, I'll say two things. One is I'd rather have weekend at Bernie's than Bernie Sanders <laughs> any day of the week. Like I am on the no commie agenda. So like whatever it takes, like you could literally put the dead guy up there and do the puppetry better than Bernie Sanders. So that's what you were up against. Totally get that. But the second thing is I just I said like, I'm not a conspiracy kind of person that much, but I just feel like he's not going to be the guy or whoever the VP is. It's like a Bush Cheney situation again. So I think you have to just really pay attention to what's going on around him because I would just be really surprised come November that like people in their heart of hearts were like, yeah, no, this is like who we want to be leading the free world. But then again, you have Donald Trump leading the free world. So who the heck knows? I mean, like we're living in bizarre world to begin with. Right, and there's a part of me too. I, I follow all that, but I also wonder if they come. It comes to a point where they are just going to say, you know what? There's no way we can win. Period. So why waste? any of our good talent by embarrassing them and saddling them up to Joe Biden. And then you can get a Stacey Abrams. That would be the, the tip off that they've just given up and they're, they know they're going to lose. Because watching the, the press conferences that they do every day now, if you sit there for one minute and picture Joe Biden up there as the president trying to answer those questions, you know that that would not look anything like it does. And it would be scarier than what we're seeing right now. At least now I get to laugh every day when I watch it. But, 
Biden with a mental like, meltdown? I can't believe you actually watch this crap. Like, oh, I, I think it's hilarious. It's the best show on at 6 p.m. I have, I have taken, like, to go full-on animal videos. <laughs> like, like, I am doing reruns of America's Funniest Animal Videos. Like, I have become Tom Bergeron of the internet. <laughs> not with any of this stuff anymore. But it's interesting, as we talk about, like, the Democrat delusion. Like, their delusion runs deep, Tracy. And I appreciate that you're giving them this, like, mastermind like hey like why we're gonna lose for they're so delusional they have no idea so i don't imagine they would ever go down that route they have too many shenanigans too many tricks too many dirty deeds like they would just like connive until the end of time to find some way to win i don't see them being like hey we're just gonna play the long game here and like well whatever next four years we'll just play it for for what, like, I, I just, I don't, I don't buy it. I'm not buying what you're selling on that one. I think it's highly generous of you. And um, yeah. Just <laughs> I just can't imagine that everybody in there shares the delusion. I get being delusional, but is there not one person in that group that says, hey guys, have you not seen it? I mean, Joe Rogan is now blown up. they have on their side. Have you right? seen who they're like, the, the future of their party? Like, <laughs> yeah. Seen the people that are hanging around. It's not good, Tracy Connors. It's not good. I don't know if you've seen No, that. I get that, Carol Roth, but I'm saying they have access to the same information that we do. And when Joe Rogan on the most popular podcast on the entire planet twice says he cannot vote for Joe Biden, the first time he says he'd rather vote for Trump, the second time he says he'd rather vote for Mike Tyson, you don't think that doesn't wake people the hell up on their side and say, hey. Okay, yeah, so what they're going to do is they're going to go after Mike Tyson. And be like, we will secure the African-American vote. <laughs> Centrist. Yep. He likes tigers. Tiger King was very popular with the millennials on Netflix. I think we should pick Mike Tyson. Like, I think he owns a pot their, company, too. That's Doesn't he now? He's a bit of an entrepreneur. He knows. I, don't know, but I have to say, I saw his one man show in Vegas. It was <laughs> one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my entire life. Totally not intentionally. It was oh. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, laugh how you laugh all you want, Carol, but you haven't seen Mike Tyson's Medicare reform bill. It's fantastic. <laughs> I, you, you, you bleeped out there and Mike Tyson, what? His Medicare reform bill. It's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, honestly, who who knows about, you know, punching up people and putting them in the emergency room more than Mike Tyson. Honestly, if you had to say to me, okay, here are your options, Carol. Like, but this is America, so we only get two really crappy options. <laughs> Option one is you've got Bernie and AOC, Rashida Tlaib, and Ilhan Omar working with Nancy Pelosi on a Medicare for All bill. Or you've got Mike Tyson working on a, on a health care reform. Who are you going to back? I'm backing Mike Tyson. I'm just saying. Well, has anyone in the federal government proven that they're better with money than Mike Tyson? I don't think so. <laughs> they're as good as Mike Tyson is. At least he got some pretty tigers out of it. Right. I don't know what the federal government has to show for all of the spending, but uh, he at least had some, some nice bling. Right. Yeah. A couple more things, Carol. You know, you said that you, uh, or w we know that you have been involved with small business for a long time. You have a small business right now that really provides a valuable service. Tell everyone about Future File. Yes. So I have a kit that is a legacy and information and wishes planning kit called Future File, futurefile.com. And the whole idea of it is to help you to organize your wishes and information for your loved ones. And it covers everything from medical emergencies to, you know, your house burns down to somebody passes away. Um, and it gets everything organized. And there's a bunch of stuff that you probably have thought of and never gotten around to. And there's a bunch of stuff that you never thought of. So let's say in the time of COVID, 
something happens, your loved one is rushed to the hospital. Like, do you know what medications they're on? Do you know that something that could interact with whatever they have going on? If they are put, God forbid, on a ventilator and you have to go back and pay the bills, like, do you know how to access those accounts? Do you know what those accounts are? Do you have the passwords and do you have the security questions? Because if you have to access them from your computer instead of their computer, they're going to say, we don't recognize this device. What's the security question? Um, God forbid something happens, someone doesn't make it. Do you have the plans? Have you thought through it financially? Social media profiles, like all those kinds of things. I created it because my dad created the prototype for my sister and I. He was in a freak accident in 2013 and we had to use it and it provided so much help to us. Hundreds, if not thousands of hours of time, $10,000 and just like complete comfort that it's a mission-based business. So we have a kit and we have a Windows-based software. Both are $99.99. Um, and every single, we've not had one single return on all of the products. Wow. So we've been at this for several years. Um, and, you know, we've helped, we've had people whose loved ones have passed or have been through emergencies come back to us and say how helpful it is. So um, now is the time when you're sitting around with your family, you know, doing these Zoom calls and whatnot. Like, if you don't know everything from their medical wishes to powers of attorney to where the will is located to whatever it is, like, get that together now and Future File walks you through it step by step. And also, you're a podcaster now. Tell us about your podcast. Yes, I have a podcast called The Roth Effect. Um, it is on wherever fine podcasts are downloaded. And there's usually a subject that we're tackling that relates to the zeitgeist, individual rights or, or the like. So, you know, episodes that are upcoming are things like within the era of COVID, you know, what is the role of individual rights? Um, you know, when you have something like a pandemic. So we've got Jerome Brook from the Ayn Rand Institute talking about that. We have some business experts who are coming to talk about getting your small business back on its feet, um, you know, when things reopen. Um, and then we've had some just, just things that I just liked and thought were funny, like Murr from Impractical Jokers, because he was available. So why not, right? right. I mean, I, like, I love Murr. I love Impractical Jokers. Keeping me sane in this time of COVID with the laughs. Um, so yeah, so that's what we try to do is just, it's a it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, a lot of healthcare, a lot of individual rights, um, a lot of, you know, business finance market kind of stuff. Um, we've had some some interesting guests. Steve Forbes on monetary policy should find that one, especially with what's going on in the Fed right now. And, you know, he makes the case um, for all the bad things that the Fed's been doing and why they should be abolished or at least uh, called back to what they used to be. So, you know, lots of, lots of interesting folks. I still see your action figure behind you. You're the only person I know that has an action figure. Well, since he mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> there she is. <laughs> see, of course, got a copy of my book, The Entrepreneur Equation. She does not have her future file with her, but she's been working on it, so... Well, there you go. Tracy, final questions for Car Carol before we let her go? No, I was just going to say, I, I would encourage everybody in this, if you've got free time, read The Entrepreneur Equation. It's a great book. And if you're thinking about starting something like a new business right now and looking at how to get into that, let Carol give you a little bit of reality check of what you're <laughs> going to get into. But if you can get through that book and still feel motivated to do it, I say go for it. Well, there you have it. Uh, Carol, final question. Uh, everyone in the family have plenty of toilet paper? So for those who know me well, know that I have been a long time advocate for the bidet slash washlet. Okay. And I, of course, have a Toto washlet in my bathroom. And it has the whole slew of things from a warmed seat to spray it that adjusts in multiple positions and can pulse if you want it to or don't want it to. And it has a dryer um, and all kinds of things. So because I have a washlet, my need for toilet paper is significantly reduced. 
Um, but I do come from a family of like kind of baby hoarders. So I always have a bunch of everything. So between the two, uh, we're doing fine. Um, although depending on how this lasts, you know, cause I do like to kind of check in on things, paper towels, toilet paper and disinfectant wipes are very, very difficult to come by. If you want crappy paper towels, you can get them at Staples. Um, staples.com because of the office supply so right. they're not like the nice one but you know it doesn't a pinch um the other stuff like good luck to you uh, i have a friend who has a poor man's washlet is that what you called it yeah it's a washlet uh, they, a day. yeah they they ran a, a splitter a yeah splitter and they took one of those uh hoses that you have on the side of your sink to wash dishes and that's what they use and i a lot, a lot of pl i mean that's a bidet that's what i mean that's that's like a like you said like kind of a but if, if you go to other countries that use the sort of they're down with the bidet that's i mean that's totally acceptable if you're you haven't been acclimated to the bidet washlet lifestyle i highly recommend it and i feel like <laughs> america is such a clean country with everything like compared to other countries i just am surprised it hasn't caught on yet it's um life-changing and I, as that I advocate highly for it, the Toto washlet's great because you can just install it right on in place of the seat of your existing toilet. So you don't have to like, you know, install a whole toilet or anything. It's very easy. And if you have like any plumbing capabilities, you can do it or you can put a, you know, a plumber to work once the, the COVID time passes, but highly, highly recommend it. And then the next time there's a whole toilet paper to do, you can say, oh, that Carol Robb, she told me about the washlet. And yeah, it's a good thing. The only thing I'll disagree with you there is, I, I don't know if we're a clean people, Carol. We had the government telling us how to wash our hands on a regular <laughs> basis. <laughs> Okay, okay, but like again, this is on a relative basis. We are yeah. relatively <laughs> clean. So they have to tell us that. Imagine what they have to tell other people. Like, have you been on the subway in France before? Like, they don't even wear deodorant. Yeah. So, like, as gross apparently as we are, um, there are people who are grosser that still use a bidet. And that's why the whole sort of like conundrum is, is very confusing to me. Well, Follow Carol I on Twitter. Oh, go ahead. No, you, she, it's going to send us off on another tangent here because sp speaking of grossness, this has confounded me. And I think the business press was way ahead on the COVID virus coming just because you all are keeping an eye on China because you got to watch everything to watch the market, right? So I heard it talked about it in January. And yeah, but so, here's what I'll say about that. Everyone, so, mm -hmm. so I want to give everybody, and I'll throw myself under the bus here, is they're like, oh, but like, you know, so-and-so said it wasn't a big deal. Well, like, what were you doing like the first day of March? Like, <laughs> right. I got on an airplane to New York City. So I knew it was problematic and I wore gloves and I wiped everything down, but I didn't think it was going to kill me. You know what I mean? So yeah. I thought, well, like even my own thing, I knew it was serious, but I didn't think it was like stay in my house for like 18 months and like I'm going to die serious which by the way, I still think might be a little excessive. So I, you know, I, I love all of these armchair quarterbacks. You're like, well, you know, this news people didn't say that. <laughs> well, like I'm going to, I walk the talk. Like I got on an airplane in, in February and I got on in March, like literally the week before I went into quarantine, I was in New York city, like, like whatever. Um, trying to take precautions with the same precautions that I take for flu that we did we didn't have the information the WHO told us it was not transmittable from person to person people said it was more similar to the flu that if you were in a high risk group like somebody who had uh, was a smoker or had an issue I mean that the information that we're getting was coming out of China it sucked it wasn't right. good information. <laughs> right. so like I, I don't know who these people are who felt like they were ahead of the curve now I will say Quote the Raven, Chris, he was pretty ahead of the curve, but he's contrarian and he's bare, so he's kind of like that on everything. So he's always gonna bet that. But I'm somebody who's usually like, if something's bad, like I'm gonna be an early person and my own behavior just, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. So um, I, I think it's it's kind of foolhardy for you to go, oh, well, you know, they, they, these people said that. Well, like, what were you doing? You didn't know. Right. Yeah, no, but my my larger point was that, so China had this outbreak in, in January, according to them, 
you know, now we're finding out it's sooner, whatever. But on a hygiene scale, they're pretty low down. I don't know if you've oh. ever been there. Oh, I've never right. been, but I've read David Sedaris's right. account. Yeah, they spit on the street. They your little kids go to the bathroom. They, they so, don't have toilet paper in many places. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> right. they, they this would, isn't funny. Yeah. This is like, hey, if you're going there, bring like to, especially because I have like um, clients that have factories there that are in some of the less established provinces, and it's like you're gonna need to bring toilet paper with you because like there is none in the bathroom. Yeah. And so my question is either, by the way. Yeah. Why are we still believing that it was contained to Wuhan? What do you mean? With with their level of hygiene, we're now believing China's numbers. Oh, we we stopped it. It never got out to Shanghai, even though five million people leave Wuhan before Chinese New Year. Yeah, to travel to all these cities. Any, I don't believe okay. any number that Good. comes out of China ever. And, never, and that's where the <laughs> right. business community also has been ahead because yes. you know whether it's growth, stocks, whatever, like you can never trust a number that comes out of there. So this is not new information, generally speaking. But I, it's do just, remember, I do yeah. remember that doctor in December who was like, hey, there's something going on. And then the, the government's like, no, no, make take that back. He's like, oh, just kidding. I take that back. And then he died. Right. So I, I do remember thinking like, oh, that's weird. Um, but again, still didn't think it was at sort of the level it is. Although, again, I still like not to not take it seriously. I, I'm still somewhere more in the middle with the whole thing. So I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of like being in a scary movie where you want to see it in the theater so everybody else gets anxious and it ramps you up too. Because the yeah. whole world's almost on lockdown. What are we, six billion people now basically living in quarantine of some form or another? We can't be the only ones. Look at those Crazy cowboy thing. Americans. Yeah. Early on, I said to my husband, who will verify this if you talk to him, I said, you know, like, Honestly, if we really just wanted to, to deal with this, we get all the countries in agreement and we would just go, have everyone go on lockdown for two weeks, it would be good. And I was like, I just don't think you could do that. It's like silly. And then I was like, ah, whatever. And then everyone starts doing it, but they did it in such a haphazard fashion that it wasn't like everyone together. So it didn't have that like clamp down. So then you had this like rolling escape thing and then people are locked down and people are spring breaking and, you know, it screwed up the whole thing. But that was my original thought was like, what about this? And then, it, cause you know, I'm a problem solver. And so I, I well, my boring household, I walk around saying things like this. <laughs> and then I, and I was like, eh, no, I don't, whatever. I'm, that's silly. You can't shut shut things down ha 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 <laughs> <laughs> well a lot of times you can't even get five people in the same family to agree to do something at the same time let alone all the countries in the world and that would have i mean honestly if, if you could have done that if you had a coordination that would have been because again two weeks versus what we're up against if, if people had the foresight for that that really, really would have worked well, but nobody ever listens to me, so whatever. <laughs> well, we listen to you, Carol. The, the people who do listen to me do very well. I just wish more people would listen to me. So appreciate you guys listening to me and all of your listeners listening to me. And they're probably like, where did you find that crazy lady? <laughs> She's been in her house way too long. <laughs> <laughs> well, People need to find out more about Future File. Go to futurefile.com. Go to carolroth.com. Follow her on Twitter at Carol J.S. Roth. Uh, and, of course, find the Roth Effect podcasts on your favorite podcast platform. Carol, you've always been so generous with your time. I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Thank you. No, it's always fun playing with you guys, and I appreciate that uh, after all these years, you still <laughs> like me back. <laughs> You haven't gotten sick of me yet. That's a good thing. It's feather in my cap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carol. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.